So I think we're ready to get going. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Centre for Aging Better's breakfast event. How can local leadership deliver better later lives for us all? For those of you who don't know me, my name's Natalie Turner. I'm the head of localities at the Centre for Aging Better. And we're really pleased this morning to be hosting this event in a backdrop in Greater Manchester, which is the UK's first age-friendly city region, and also in association with the Local Government Association, who also partnered with us on this event. So that's great news. Um, we'll be joined in a moment by a panel, and I'll introduce, introduce them one by one, and they'll come up and say a few words. And then we're going to be taking questions from the room, but then also from our audience online. Um, and that's a reminder, really, that we're live streaming this event this morning's discussion today through our social media channels. And the recording will be available to those people, to all of you, online on our social media channels, on YouTube channel, after the event has finished. And for those of you who are tuning in today, if you want to post questions, you can post questions using Twitter or YouTube chat, which you should be able to see on your screen as well. Um, so before I move to our panel, we've got a terrific panel lined up. Um, I'm just going to set the scene, really, about why we're here and what this event is all about. Um, well, we're undergoing a massive age shift. In 20 years' time, over 40% of us will be aged 50 or over. And more than two-thirds of the growth in the UK population will come from the over 60s age group. Put simply, more of us are living longer than ever, any generation ever before. And that's an incredible achievement, and it's something we don't celebrate enough. Um, however, those figures I just talked about are averages, and they hide a great deal of variation from place to place. In fact, this is not a future scenario for one in three local authorities who are already at or further ahead on those percentages, particularly rural and coastal areas. And the potential benefits and opportunities, which are enormous of us living those longer lives, are not available everywhere in the country. And some of you would already have heard the coverage that's happened in Marmot. And we ourselves also carried out analysis last week into show what we call unacceptable inequalities in how long and how healthily babies that are born today in different parts of England can expect to live. So I'll give you an example around that. As well as a close to a decade in extra years, a boy in Richmond-upon-Thames, a local authority in London, can expect to enjoy almost two decades longer of good health than a baby boy born in Blackpool. And gaps between places are huge, but within places, they're also equally, if often not more, stark. So going back to London, in Westminster, seat of our government, the local authority there, the gap in healthy life expectancy, that's how long we can expect to live in good, um, life, um, good health, is over 25 years. So gaps between and within places are enormous. Now, ageing is inevitable, but how we age is not. Yes, national government has an enormous part to play, and we have asked of the national government, which we make all the time. But leadership is also needed locally if we're all going to benefit equally from our longer lives in all of our places. And a key source of that leadership must be local government. Local government has a unique and special place and sense of place um, that can allow it to make the kind of changes or lead and convene around the kind of changes we think matter, changes in transport, in housing, in employment, in communities and how we live locally that can have an enormous impact. And we can act now as well. I think we'll be talking a little bit more about that in order for us all to have better later lives in the future. The other thing I do want to sort of share a caveat, knowing both who is in the room and who is around the country, is local leadership comes from lots of different places. It also, older people, residents, third sector, businesses, all have a part to play and are and are, have a massive role to play around the country. But today, we're going to be focusing particularly on local government, and that's where our panel today is going to be bringing perspectives from. So, to this morning's speakers. So, I'm going to introduce, first of all, Paul McGarry. Paul, I've known for a while, Paul. Paul is the lead for Greater Manchester's Ageing Hub, um, assistant director for the uh, Greater Manchester Ageing Hub, spent, to around, spent around two decades on this issue, leading teams first in Manchester and now in Greater Manchester, and as lead for the Age-Friendly Manchester programme, 
was a founding member of both the WHO's and the UK Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. He also holds a research fellowship in sociology at the University of, Man of Manchester and is helping fill the evidence gap around a lot of these issues we're going to be talking about today. Over to you, Paul. Uh, thanks, Natalie, and uh, thanks to everybody for uh, making it this morning. Um, so, um, I wrote my first um, ageing or older people's action plan, I think it was about 1996, 1997. And um, I always say that the topics and themes that were part of that plan, housing, transport, isolation, um, are still the topics and themes that are features of our programmes now. So some things don't change too much, but um, the world around us changes a lot, I guess. Um, and over those 15 to 20 years, I've been I got involved in or a participant in, in one way or another, I think all the major national uh, and international programmes on ageing since the founding of a programme called Better Government for Older People in uh, the late 1990s. So what I wanted to do in my uh, uh, eight minutes or so is just try and distill my experiences under three headings. Um, the kind of location of leadership, the conceptual approach taken by uh, leaders and the organisational forms. And uh, if you're smarter than, than, than I was when I wrote that, that spells out LCO. Um, um, that's an in-joke for those of us, or not maybe an in-joke for those of us. In, I was going to go with something that spelled out LSD, but uh, that seemed in a... <laughs> inappropriate, although who knows. Um, so I just want to talk about the kind of location of leadership, uh, first of all, because nine times out of 10 and 95% of strategies you read about ageing from local government over the last 20 years, certainly, have been written and led by um, a, a care organisations, social care departments and so on. And I think throughout that period, uh, the last 15 to 20 years, um, there's been a tension and often this competition between different gazes or different perspectives on uh, older people and ageing. Uh, and one of the examples that comes to mind is um, when Opportunity Age was published by um, New Labour in about 96, 95, 96, um, literally the day before, the um, Department of Health published their own report on older people and ageing. So right at the centre of government, although you had cross-governmental strategies, there was still competition at a national level. And I think that feeds through, uh, or tension, shall we say, and that feeds through, I think, to local government as well. And particularly in local government where um, uh, it's very difficult to assemble and create leadership around ageing populations that's outside of a health or social care gaze. And I think that's been one of the... Um, one of the uh, tensions and one of the um, problems for is in this agenda. I would say from 2010 and 11, first of all, austerity so uh, has made the situation worse and also a lack of national strategy on ageing. So there were national strategies from the late 90s to about 2010-11. Um, those kind of disappeared. and uh, there's, We're only, I think, recovering from that period of a lack of um, uh, national leadership uh, on this agenda. In other places, whether in academia or in some of the think tanks or the national charities on ageing, uh, on various um, House of Lords reports, every year or every two years, a significant report comes out and says, we're not ready for ageing populations. The same thing every year, year in, year out, a different Lord, a different uh, think tank. But it seems to me the kind of things are starting to shift now, not least because um, as local authorities, um, uh, I think we're waking up to the broader set of issues around ageing, although it's very difficult, I think, to go into a, uh, a local authority and say ageing's an opportunity uh, when, when local authorities are facing significant challenges around social care funding uh, uh, and so on. I think the other feature of this work is that in local government, um, there's, as in national government, as in lots of agencies, and we were hearing yesterday at an event about how um, businesses and big large corporations still have a kind of siloed approach to ageing, is that we still don't really focus on neighbourhoods, on cities, on older people as older people. We focus on a range of services, whether it's housing 
or care or health, and usually on those who are uh, most uh, in need or most vulnerable, whatever language we want to use. I think the other <clears throat> element in terms of the kind of location of leadership is it has to be a leadership that um, is able to work across multiple issues and topics, often at the same time. And you'll hear us about some of that, I think, from some of my colleagues. So ageing is about culture, it's about employment, uh, it's about the everyday lives, it's about fun, it's about enjoyment, it's about the things that we do in our lives and that we want older people, and particularly those on low incomes, to enjoy. <clears throat> and I think the last point about location of leadership is that... Um, the the, 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 that leadership has to have the convening power to bring together a, a large group of actors. In Manchester, where I worked for over 25 years, our work was based in the equality stream, although we were in public health. We were based in the, the kind of um, that perspective as ageing as, a, as, a, as an equalities issue rather than a service issue, and that's shaped all the work that we did. <clears throat> there are challenges in that because... It's then difficult, I think, to involve some of our partners, particularly who are at the kind of sharp end of delivering services in that work. And I think as we move forward, that relationship between the kind of equalities agenda and the care and health agenda is one that is, isn't settled and that we need to work on. Just in terms of conceptual approach, um, <clears throat> I think location to a certain extent of that leadership defines the conceptual approach that we take. Uh, we published... Um, uh, something, I don't know, about a few years ago, um, which set out three different approaches to ageing. And this was an attempt really by us to explain to people what we did and why they paid our wages, I suppose. But we said there was a kind of biomedical gaze on ageing, which is the one that's typically uh, active in the health services. There's one what we call the care gaze, which again is that place between uh, kind of health services, but often in social care, which focuses on uh, low, relatively small numbers of vulnerable uh, people who need specialist services. And then we argued for a, a citizen approach to ageing, which looked at the scale of this, the city, which talked about the rights to the cities, about uh, participation, focused on inequalities, uh, and so on. So that was, um, there's something about, I think, the conceptual approach to ageing, which is important. And whether you call it uh, an approach based on social inclusion, uh, on citizenship, I don't think really matters. But what matters is that we need a broader narrative and understanding of urging. I should also say it was informed by the kind of critical social gerontology, um, which um, we kind of uh, bumped into some colleagues from, uh, first of all, Keele and then Manchester universities, who were national and international leaders on urging. And this en on enriched our work significantly in terms of our understanding, of our questioning of some of the work that we did, uh, and on our ability to uh, make uh, partnerships with uh, key uh, academics. I think the other part in terms of the kind of um, conceptual approach is that we place older people at the centre of decision making. And we all say that. It's a kind of eternal truth. But actually doing it are, uh, on a meaningful, in a meaningful way and building up the trust uh, with different communities and neighbourhoods is something which is labour intensive, which takes skill and commitment. Uh, and is a rocky road sometimes, but without that, I think you do half the job or maybe a quarter of the job. We also, in terms of that conceptual approach, I think it feeds a narrative. Uh, we're working uh, on our GM narrative on ageing at the moment with our colleagues in the combined authority, and it seems to me that that narrative has to be realistic, it has to be challenging, and it has to be one that ordinary people understand. Uh, I'm running out of time quickly, so I just want to move on to organisation. Uh, again, another cliche, form follows function, but in terms of organisation, we need leadership um, that brings together and convenes multi-agency partners, that brings together researchers, policymakers, citizens, and increasingly private sector agencies. We need leaders that are able to develop emblems of what our approach looks like. Um, uh, these might be the My Generation nightclub uh, in Manchester, a uh, new centre on ageing and creativity that we're establishing soon, the work around employment and older workers that Matt's leading, um, uh, Manchester City Council's age-friendly newspaper, which has a print run of 17,000, the work that we do internationally, the Pride in Ageing programme, the establishment of the UK network of age-friendly cities. These are all the elements and, uh, uh, of, um, I think, organ an organisational approach. 
And last but not least, this kind of idea of social movement around ageing, the work that uh, our Ambition for Ageing programme, and the Mayoral Challenge, which brings together 53 different neighbourhoods. So these are all elements, or emblems, or indicators, I think, that you're getting leadership right. Just a few final thoughts. There is always an, a, an elephant in the room. It seems to me the elephant in our room is ageism and the attitude that public services, uh, that citizens, that others take towards older people and do just see them as a problem. It can be patronising, dismissive, uh, uh, unlearning, unlistening. And it seems to me that we absolutely have to change and challenge how we see ageing in this country. Um, the other thing is that we have to take chances in our work. Our work has always been what's on the horizon. How can we combine with the agendas that are emerging? I think this is the green agenda is one that we're trying to uh, understand at the moment. We need to understand better the generational, the post-war generational contract, which is under strain at the moment. The last thing I just want to say uh, about leadership is um, if you don't think you're wrong on a regular basis, I don't think you're doing a good job. And we think, or I think, maybe it's just me, think that sometimes we're getting it wrong. And uh, because if you peer across the country and internationally, well, internationally is a bit different, but you peer across this country, there aren't significant numbers of people taking the approach that we've taken over a long time. So either we're right and everybody else is wrong or vice versa, and that's really up for you to choose. Uh, uh, enjoy the debate and discussion, uh, and I uh, look forward to your questions. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. A real reminder of actually how people need to join things up locally, but also that link between national and local as well. Lots more to pick up on. So to our second speaker... Councillor Richard Kemp is the leader of the Liberal Democrats on Liverpool City Council, his longest serving councillor, 37 years, we were talking about earlier. He's also the deputy chair and Liberal Democrat spokesperson on the Local Government Association's Community Wellbeing Board, where he leads on public health and community-based health activities. So he's going to bring us a really broader perspective, particularly for one for himself as a local politician on this agenda. Right, thank you. So you've already spoiled my opening comments because I was going to have to tell you that I'm, when you look at me, you have to remember I'm old. Uh, I particularly felt that, I must tell you, at six o'clock this morning, I thought I'm retired now, in so far that people like me ever retire, and getting up at six o'clock in the dark uh, was, uh, was a, bit of a, a bit of a challenge, particularly as my wife's away at the moment. So I had to do my own breakfast. It's, uh, it's terrible. Uh, and the other thing I would ask you to remember, with respect, is that I come from Liverpool. Uh, now, I, I don't mind, and it's the second time I've done it this week. I was in this street at another conference yesterday. So I think you should appreciate the fact that I've left the security of the premier city of the north of England <laughs> to come to one of our lower class suburbs over here in Manchester. Now, as you know, I've admitted it, I'm old. Uh, but I haven't got old uh, accidentally. I haven't got old immediately. I've been getting old since the day I was born. And that's the important challenge that we as uh, councillors uh, and our staff have in local government. I can tell you now with absolute certainty the people who in 55 years will be going to have a happy and unhealthy third age whenever that might start because they're without a doubt the 11 year olds and there's three percent of them who are morbidly obese they will no matter what they do they can go to weight watchers and do the lot but their musculoskeletal system will not have formed properly and they will go through and have an early uh, retirement, an early giving up of work, if they can work at all, and they're likely to have three major incidents uh, more than anyone else in the health service in the course of their life. So ageing starts early, and much of what we want to do now is future-proofing the one-year-olds rather than dealing with the 65-year-olds. And that's very difficult for us to deal with because adult social care in local government is in crisis. 52% of the budget that we will discuss next Wednesday in Liverpool 
will go to adult social care. None of it in the way that we'd like it to be, preventative and supportive, just pretty well managing those people in huge uh, social uh, and physical uh, needs. So what, if that is the situation, can we do about it? Uh, and the first thing is, of course, that we must work in partnership with people like the health service. And that's one of the difficulties. Uh, the other conference I was at, we, someone presented 32 pages of PowerPoints on about a mental health strategy yesterday. And then the health service responded with another 24. And I just all thought it was bollocks, basically. A load of complicated mishmash. So I want to just give you one quotation about ageing that I hope you'll take away with you and think about. And it's one of our most intellectual, uh, uh, intellectually respected individuals from Liverpool, Professor Sir Kenneth Dodd, Esquire. And in fact, I could sing it for you, if you like. Would anyone like me to sing it? Yeah, you, 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 you must be mad if you uh, want me to sing it. But he actually sang a song, didn't he? He said, happiness, happiness, the greatest gift that I possess. I thank the Lord that I've been blessed with more than my share of happiness. Because the fact is, if you reach 65 or 75 or 85 and you're happy, you're going to have a longer retirement and a healthier retirement. And what makes you happy? The house you live in, the neighbourhood you live in, the fact you've got your friends and family around or near you, you're supported in your community. And those are the sorts of things that I and every other councillor in the country spends all their time doing. Let me just give you some examples from my own ward that I'm doing and show how they build up. We are a dementia-friendly neighbourhood. Once a year, we bring together all the shops on Allerton Road, Penny Lane, Rose Lane, to have a talk about what dementia means to them, their clients, the people who use their churches. And we have a little plan and we know how to work together. Costs 500 pounds, probably saves the health service 50,000 because people get properly looked after in the community. We have a lovely park called Calderstones Park, 113 acres, which if you go to, you instinctively know is full of people who are mentally and physically fit. It's a huge capital outlet if we were trying to create a new one. So what we're looking to do there is to double the number of people that use that park. Because if you're out walking, if you're out chatting, if you're going to the cafe with your mates, if you're doing a bit of yoga, we're looking at putting in a, a third age gym, uh, which I've said that I would use. Uh, I make these rash promises just before elections, as we all do. But here's an existing facility that costs us the equivalent of 500 hospital bed spaces, non-acute hospital bed spaces a year. If we double the amount we spent on it, perhaps we could save more than 500 bed spaces for people because they don't get ill and sick in the first place and they have a better or more active life. So uh, we do that sort of thing. And we bring together all the organizations in our area uh, because I'm a highly visible person. And that's the difference between local government and almost any other player. If you don't like what's going on in my community, you come and see me about it or my two colleagues. If you don't know who I am, you know there's a councillor, you'll go and look up how to find me. And if you don't know precisely what the council does, you know there's a council. But let me tell you, let me let, me let you into a little secret. No one knows what a CCG is. No one knows what a primary care network is, but they expect me to know. So people will come in to me regularly and say, hey, councillor, I know this isn't your job, but, because, of course, it is my job. And as a ward councillor, I then build up. Now, someone should have reminded me that I've got a load of slides here which say uh, all this, so let me see if I can move them on. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, this is what the officers do. So, uh, you know, I, I, they always try and make me look good. I hope there's none of them watching the, uh, the, the, the live broadcast now. Uh, so what I do then is to use that local knowledge and layer it up. So I gave you the example of the better use of my park. Well, if we get that right, this is a model we can use in every part in Liverpool, and I'll share it through the local government association uh, with other councils so they can use their parks differently. And I can share it with the health service because the only people who've got any money in the system at the moment, they moan about how little they've got, is the NHS. They haven't had any cuts at all compared to what uh, we've had to put up with, and they're still highly bureaucratised and highly centralised. Uh, something I didn't say because most of the people yesterday from the NHS, but it's uh, nevertheless true. So we can use what we do ward by ward, neighbourhood by neighbourhood, community commu by community, to build up a citywide strategy for happiness, to build up then national takes, which not only inform local government, but we can use in our lobbying position. I was down as an all party group about age on ageing uh, on, uh, uh, in Parliament on Monday to try and influence those changes. So you may think we're unimportant, but we're visible, we're there, we're active, we're partnership builders, and it's the partnerships that we need to build that will make the real difference for not only the elderly people in our communities, but for our communities as a whole. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. A um, uh, really good example. So if you get that park right, we'd be interested in hearing more about it as well at Centre for Ageing Better. I'm sure other people would as well. A really good example of how nothing is too small to start with. Um, so to my next speaker, um, Pam Smith is the Chief Executive of Stockport Council and, the Greater, Ma and Greater Manchester's Lead Chief Executive for Age Friendly Greater Manchester. Pam's passion is to build strong teams which have residents of all ages at the heart of everything the council does and will be providing some examples in a little bit more detail for us all here. Welcome, Pam. Good morning, everyone. Um, and it is my job to serve all residents. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a little check. Have I got any residents of Stockport in the room? Oh, wow. Right, okay, so you guys pay uh, my wages, uh, so um, you can uh, give me some feedback on uh, today's performance and see if, it's, see if I'm worth the value for money. Um, and I think I make that point because it's really important. I'm there to serve all residents. And Richard made some really good points about that starts at zero. Because if we don't uh, start providing things to help our children in early years, they're going to become the adults with the problems later on in life. And the inequalities um, of how people live in older age start then. So it's down to me as chief executive to prioritise those things which really matter to my members, first and foremost, and to my residents, and make sure that we work collaboratively with them. And I wanted to make a, a few points about the role of the chief executive. It is to work in partnership. It is to convene all the people who have the skills and expertise to deliver for residents. But it's also about engaging residents in that discussion, what really matters to them, finding that out. And it is at neighbourhood level. N different neighbourhoods need different things. Yes, everybody needs a house. Um, if you haven't got a house, you can't be healthy, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes different neighborhoods need to focus on different things. So you've got to make sure that the districts that you're serving, there is differentiation. It's not one size fits all. And you can't assume that what you want in older age as your aging is what somebody else wants. Making those um, and I think professionally arrogant assumptions is not right. It is about, and there are some, there are some buzzwords, aren't there? There's the words co-production. Uh, that's, that's just a posh word for talking to people um, and finding out uh, what, it, what, it, what it is that they, they, they really want. But you have to have a strategy around it. 
local government has not got an infinite amount of money. It's got a lot of challenges. Uh, Richard mentions the adult social care budget. I could mention the children's budget. There's lots of different pressures on local government. So you have to have a strategy. And what we've done in Stockport, as an example, is have an all-age living strategy. So because we are doing something fundamentally brilliant, and I would say that, wouldn't I? And my residents are in the audience. You can check, you can check them out later. Um, we are creating in our town centre the newest, greenest, coolest neighbourhoods. Um, within that, we're going to have some fantastic buildings, but it's about creating the neighbourhoods. And at the centre of that is our older people. So this isn't about creating neighbourhoods where this is where the old people live. This is where the young people live. This is where the smart apartments are. This is, it's about having an all-age approach. And it's interesting that, the, um, that Richard used the word happy because um, what we say in Stockport is we want you to live your best life. Um, and our strategy says happy, healthy homes to age well in Stockport. And it, is a, and it is about that. But you have to have a strategy because we've only got a finite amount of resource. And you have to be a disruptor. So one of my jobs is, and some of my colleagues across the Stockport system will attest to this, I'm quite sure, you have to be a disruptor. But that is a disruptor for good. Um, and it's about saying, look, we're not happy. What, where we are now isn't good enough. Um, as Paul outlined, we've had strategy upon strategy about what should we do with an ageing population. So this is about setting up some exemplars. And one of my jobs is to do that. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have um, a piece of land in the middle of Stockport Town Centre, and we are going to have on there um, a wellbeing and health academy. But what we're doing is we're having, going to have mixed use of housing on it. So yes, we will take the opportunity to look at having a really great intermediate care facility. We're not going to call it that, by the way, because that's old language. But we're also going to have intergenerational housing on that site. Um, because then we will have people ageing at, at different times. They will, they, rather than everybody, oh, we're in a gated community of all over 55-year-olds, which are absolutely fine for some people. We want to create a much more dynamic neighbourhood where we've got the different ages um, living side by side and creating that real neighbourhood and community feel. So we are going to be uh, setting that up as an, as an exemplar. And we're going to use digital technology in that housing. We're going to be very careful about our carbon footprint with that uh, housing because we what we're doing is we're not saying ageing is one stream and looking down that lens. We're saying it's a part of all of our strategies and it's central to our regeneration plans. And that's what we're trying to do. We're not siloing it in a corner. We're actually integrating it into what we do. So much so that when somebody came to visit Stockport to see what we were doing, um, I had my regeneration team and my director of adult social care in the same room talking about it, to show that this is not just about uh, the council responding in, in a siloed way. It's also about not pigeonholing public health. So um, I might be quite unusual in my authority. Public health sits in the place directorate, which is about the whole place. It doesn't sit in adult social care. There'll be people out there who would disagree with that. But I think putting public health at the heart of the place is about recognising that public health isn't just about older people or people when they get old, whatever that means. So I think the job of the chief executive is to make sure that we put ageing at the centre of what we do, but also that we have some products that we're prepared to develop as disruptors to make sure that we do that. And it's also about convening in our neighbourhoods. So we, in some of our neighbourhoods, have brilliant voluntary sector um, relationships. Um, I uh, understand the concept of social prescribing. I think that it's uh, a great concept. Do I like the name? No, because it's about saying, I'm going to write something for you that I think is good for you. 
And that, to me, isn't where we should be. We, we perhaps need a new name for it. But it's about people being able to um, say what they need and then we having available some of those products that they actually need. But not somebody um, saying, this is what I think is good for you. Because actually, as Paul's um, highlighted, that hasn't worked. That hasn't made a policy change. So I think one of the big things that, um, as a council, we're doing is making sure that we're engaging our population. Um, and we're going to take the opportunity. We've got a new borough plan uh, coming up, um, and we're taking the opportunity to engage our population in that. Um, and we're going to make sure that that engagement is relevant and it looks at how people can age successfully in a place um, and that they're rooted in, in that place. Because as you do age, you spend more and more time um, in your home, apart from if you're Richard, which is you're on the train to London more often than not. Um, but I think for me, it is about taking really seriously how people age in place, but making sure that we adapt to the world around us. Because um, if Facebook was a country, it would be bigger than China and India. And we have to make sure that our policies stay relevant to the population as it's aging now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. I think that's another vote for neighbourhoods. And um, also, I think that's right, that life course approach is really important. And something we certainly say at Centre for Aging Better, it's also never too late, not too young, but also it's never too late. And we think people, look, we can act now on people in their 50s and 60s and onwards to create better later lives. So that's fantastic to hear that support. Um, I'm going to introduce our next or our last speaker before we get to the questions, um, um, Matt Ainsworth. I introduced, I talked to him in the briefing earlier and said, you're the unusual suspect in the room, I think I said. So Matt is the Assistant Director for Employment, Strategy, Policy and Delivery at the Man at Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Um, and the reason I say he's an unusual suspect is quite often when we're talking about ageing and older people, that employment skills strategy is not in the room because we are too often looking ahead and thinking about much later life and not thinking about people now in their 50s and 60s, many and most of whom are in work. Um, Matt is responsible in his role as, for the delivery of the employment elements of Greater Manchester's groundbreaking, it, or it says here, <laughs> devolution <laughs> agreement, and also GM strategy priority around good jobs for people to progress and develop. And we've been working closely with Greater Manchester and Matt, and he'll tell you a little bit more about how we create a better offer for people over 50 who are not currently in work. So over to you, Matt. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Natalie. So I wanted to kind of cover three things today. First of all, being an unusual uh, person in the, in, in the room, um, to explain why employment is a key part of Greater Manchester's ageing strategy. Um, actually talk some, some practical about what we're doing and how local leadership really makes a difference and enables us to do some things differently in Greater Manchester. But I'm, I'm going to start with just with some of the kind of more kind of macro um, economics to start off with. So it might not necessarily feel like this always, but Greater Manchester's got record high employment rate. We've got full employment for the first time ever, which should be absolutely fantastic news because uh, we all know that good quality work provides financial security uh, and improved quality of life. We know that it can help maintain and improve mental and physical health. And we also know that it helps keep people socially active. So in that respect, I should be able to kind of leave the, leave the room now and say, great, my work here is, my work here is done. Um, yesterday, I was at the launch of the Marmot Review, so 10 years on. And that really brought home to why I cannot just leave this room now and say, great, we've got a record high employment rate, everything's rosy in the garden. We've had low or practically no uh, wage growth for 12 years. Um, poorer families in relative terms have been getting poorer. Um, we have seen increased employment. That's almost exclusively down to more women being in work. And we've seen life expectancy stall and healthy life expectancy, particularly for women, get worse. And we're also seeing uh, lower birth rates. Um, and whereas we may have seen migration as, a, as an answer to some of those issues, 
We're not quite sure what will happen with, uh, with, uh, with Brexit, so there could be some considerable um, implications. So I think it's fair to say, you know, we all want to live in a, in a society where um, work is a route out of poverty and is a route to a comfortable later life. But the reality is actually that isn't necessarily the case. And some of the greatest inequalities are affecting older people. And some of the statistics in this area really paint quite a damning picture. So for older people in Greater Manchester, we have a significantly higher unemployment rate. We have a significantly lower employment rate. And those who are in work are more likely to be in low quality and low paid work. And there are significant numbers of people trapped on benefits without a clear pathway out. And still a kind of a, kind of a damning statement that sticks in my mind, which is around health related benefits. So if you've been on a health related benefit for more than two years, you're more likely to die or go past state pension age than ever return to work. And morally, that's just unjust. That's just not right. Um, and it's also significantly holding back Greater Manchester's grand economic ambitions. Um, so I was really struck um, by some research which showed that the workforce that businesses in Greater Manchester require, or require in 20 years' time, are already in work. So just banking on, on only supporting young people and the education system um, to, to ensure we've got the kind of business leaders and, 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 um, and, and our kind of um, economic uh, drivers of the future just in reality won't cut, won't cut the mustard. We need to do significantly more with people who are already in work and more to keep older people progressing in work and healthy in work for longer. And when you think about the kind of lower birth rates and, and Brexit, that kind of doubly makes that, uh, makes that important. Um, so for me, this was what, what, what that's really shown is it changed that kind of discourse from, from one of, of um, kind of aging and, and inequality to one about aging, inequality, and, and actually productivity, which for me is really, really important. And, and does change the, it does change the conversation quite, quite significantly. And I think as somebody who's worked in the kind of welfare to work arena for some, for some time, it's one of those things that's always been there or thereabouts, but it's never really been front and center of any of, any of the work. And I've got to say that through the work and the development of the GM Aging Hub, and more recently through the relationship with, with Aging Better, that's really brought the issue to the fore in the way that we've agreed. Actually, we, do, we need to do some concerted action in this, in this space, and not on our own. Um, and we've got a really broad church of active local partners engaged in this, and actually central government. So we've got you know, third sector, academics, business groups, local authorities, Job Centre Plus, Department for Work and Pensions, Department for Education, all working together around this, around this, this, around this, uh, this agenda, which means absolutely fantastic. And it's not something I would have thought would happen only, only kind of five, five years ago. And what's good about Greater Manchester is we do have a bit of a track record of, uh, of supporting some of our most marginalised residents and really starting to kind of uh, turn the curve in terms of, uh, in terms of employment. And you know, one of the programmes which I've been lucky to be involved in for a number of years called, called Working Well has really proved that actually by taking a different approach, a real person-centred approach, you can actually support people who haven't been um, well served by previous interventions. So people on long with long-term health conditions, actually we've got programs now which are through, through looking, through supporting the individual by providing that kind of joined up health, skills, employment support in their, in their area, that kind of one-to-one -one basis, actually it can deliver some fantastic outcomes that your usual welfare to work will sit you in a room, teach you how to write a CV, give you some interview skills, just don't, just don't do. And as good as that's been, and it has been, has been really good for people with health conditions and disabilities, it's still not been as good as we would like for older people. And the reality is, I don't know why that, why that is, um, but I know that we need to do something, something differently. And uh, I did have the word co-production, and I scrubbed it out quickly after, uh, <laughs> after, uh, <laughs> after Pam mentioned it. And, uh, and one of the reasons why some of the things done aren't, haven't been as successful as they could be is actually we've not been as good as we could have been at talking to older people, and not just talking, listening to them in terms of our, in terms of developing uh, actually what a joint strategy in this area could be. 
And we're now getting better at that. And we've got kind of five key areas of work that we're, that we're, that we're now working on. So one around um, apprenticeships and older people and how we can kind of rebrand and promote those as, as a way of both getting people back into work but also progressing in work because when you speak to most people about what is an apprentice, you still see the kind of school leaver, young person. Actually, they can be a route way for significantly more people and we're piloting some activity in that space. Careers advice and guidance. You know, this idea, this kind of old-fashioned idea that you get careers advice and guidance at school or at college and then that's it, you're set for life. It's absolute rubbish. People changing careers all the time. We need to be constantly made aware of how the labour market is changing, what our options are. But the reality is most people left in the wilderness and have got no idea what's available and how to get there. So that's one thing we're, we're actively looking at. Around skills and progression. Um, so we've got devolved adult education budget. Um, we're piloting some digital skills activity for all, for all the people. And for the first time, we're actively... Uh, We've actively put um, older people as priority groups, cohorts, and we're tracking outcomes in a way that we haven't done before. <clears throat> Around employer engagement, so we've got the Good Employment Charter for Greater Manchester, which is fantastic. Looking at actually how can we embed things like flexible working just into everything that businesses, businesses do. Um, and interestingly, it's a key focus of our local industrial strategy about retaining older workers. And we know some of our key sectors, whether it's construction, adult social care, I've seen significant numbers of older people involuntarily leave those jobs. They want to stay, but they can't. So what can we do to, to change the way those jobs are configured? Because it's not beyond the wit of man to do, to do that. And, and finally, about supporting people into work. Um, and there's a whole range of things we're doing in that space with Job Centre Plus. With their, they've had work psychologists thinking about actually how can our Job Centre Plus advisors have a different conversation with people, which means fantastic to see that that part of the public sector really start to embrace this agenda. And the one thing I'm really excited about is a, a pilot which we're just about to, to launch, actually later today, uh, with, um, with Aging Better and also with, with Department of Work and Pensions, to pilot, to, I was going to say co-design, co co-produce, work with, with, um, with some local residents to help shape some innovative small interventions that they think will make a difference to support them back into work, and then look at how we can scale them up, and then look at how that can really influence national policy. And for me, none of those things would happen without some form of local leadership and coordination around it, because that they just don't happen organically, and certainly not in a joined up way. So for me, that's the added value that the aging hub and, and a kind of a, the combined authorities' role in this with its partners can, can make because we can ha start to, to bring these things together into a concerted movement towards aging and increasing the employment opportunities of all the people. Thank you, Matt. That's really helpful. I think like, my career advisor when I was 16 told me I should be a landscape gardener, so that didn't work <laughs> for me, so I agree with you. So thanks. We've heard from all of our speakers now, um, and now we're going to move. And I think we're going to get chairs up here at the front for the panellists, are we? I've been told to stand at the lectern, so I'm going to move over here. Um, um, and just to remind you that we're live streaming this event. I'm sure everyone can remember that. But um, if you're asking questions in the room, that also means them waiting for you, the microphone to get to you, because otherwise not everybody will be able to hear your questions. So while we're setting this up... And for those of you watching online, you can tweet us your questions using the hashtag, hashtag AgingBetterEvents. That's hashtag AgingBetterEvents. So if you want to add your questions onto Twitter, could you do that now? That would be fantastic. So our panellists want to come and take a seat? I'll give a thinking time to the audience. We've actually had an advanced question as well, so I might start off with that in a moment. Um, have we got anyone in the audience who wants to... Any response? Have we any questions from the front? Thank you. Um, this is for Richard. I'm also from Liverpool, Richard. So I know your neighbourhood. My question is that the neighbourhood you're representing, and I presume you live there as well, is a very affluent neighbourhood. So. Um, the, the stuff you're describing, people getting together in the shops or going in the park, 
is, I would say, easier because of economic uh, reasons. I work a lot in other communities in Liverpool where economic um, stability for their residents and home ownership and, uh, and the time and inclination to go to the park or uh, uh, the money to go to a coffee shop is not part of older people's lives. Um, and so I wondered what you would, whether you'd thought about these other communities uh, in Liverpool and across the country uh, and any comments you had about money and ageing. You're absolutely right. I represent, for those of you who don't know it, the Penny Lane area. Uh, it's Liverpool 18. It is the wealthiest ward in Liverpool. We're above average on everything you want to be above average on and well below average on everything you would want to be below average on. But I've only been the councillor there for 15 years. Before that, I was a councillor for Liverpool 8. I chaired a housing association which predominantly worked in Liverpool 8 and Liverpool 3, which are some of the poorest communities. So I accept that anything I learn in Calderstones Park won't be directly applicable to the parks in Liverpool 8, like uh, uh, Prince's Park, uh, for example. But first of all, let's not forget that Allerton Road is used heavily from people all over South, from all over South Liverpool. So if I make that dementia friendly, I'm not just making it dementia friendly for my constituents, but for the people in South Liverpool. And more than half the people who use Calderstones Park come from all over South Liverpool to do it, including Granby, including Belle Vale. But what I'm trying to establish in my ward is a series of principles that will be delivered differently elsewhere. And I'll give you an example that's nothing to do with the council. I went, I'm not around much at lunchtime, but I went to a pub in my ward recently. At lunchtime, it was absolutely full of people. because It's a carvery pub. And in my ward, they can afford six or seven pounds to go and have a two-course meal and a glass of wine or half a bitter. In Liverpool late, they can't afford that. So why don't we so socially prescribe a trip to the pub, not to just get plastered, to have a two-course <laughs> meal, have a natter, have someone to talk to, and wouldn't that be better than spending the same money on pills? So there are things we can learn in Liverpool 8 to take to Liverpool 18, and things we can learn in Liverpool 18 to take to Liverpool 8. In Liverpool 18, they've probably got the money to do it themselves. In Liverpool 8, we need to find a cost-effective way of providing the same service. Thank you, Richard. Anyone else? So I got a question here as well from John Gray, so bear with me um, while I ask it. So in rural Newark and Sherwood's 87 parishes, the 60-plus, I think he's up in Nottinghamshire, the 60-plus population is usually 30% or more of the total population. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And in a few um, cases, it's as much as 45%. Um, should we expect our parish council, district council, or county council to take a lead in making our age, uh, villages age-friendly, or should we expect to fend for ourselves? I think that really is what is that difference between what I should be doing as an individual and expectations and what we should be expecting and asking from our different council leaders. I think there's probably... I'd quite like to get a little bit of answer along. There's a few of you who could answer that question. Pam, you went... Yes, I think, as I, as I said, um, local authorities are there to serve all the residents. And I think, yes, we have to take a lead role in it. Um, we have to go and uh, speak to people, listen to them, find out what it is that's going to make a difference um, to their lives. And I think Richard gave a really good example there of it might not be um, so obvious what, what it is. Um, and I think the local authorities got to take a lead because it's a place shaper. Um, the place shaping role, and it's going to make sure that those residents are living, they are living their best life, and they are contributing and connecting with other parts of um, the place which they live. And I think local authorities can take a role in actually building those connections. If we don't take the lead in areas, some people have um, the ability to make their own connections because they're economically um, in a great situation, but others don't. And so a local authority is there to try and make sure that 
there are opportunities for all people, regardless of income, uh, regardless of age. So I think that the local authority has to take a lead um, and it has to be um, uh, innovative about that. Um, you know, we are moving into um, a digital age um, and, uh, you know, I have um, a mandate from my uh, leader to make everything digitally delicious. Uh, now, uh, what that means as you're aging, uh, what that means when you're aging, I think is really important. And that's why the local authority's got to take a lead because it's got to be the conduit for deciphering national policy, local policy, um, new trends and innovations, and, and actually um, demonstrating to um, older residents that they can be as connected as anybody else into the places that they live. And, and we, can, we can help to facilitate that. We haven't got all the answers, but we can actually help to lead and facilitate that. Brilliant, thanks. Just, just kind of adding on to, to that, and I think purely from a, from a kind of employment perspective and kind of reflect on some of the things I said, I said earlier. So local authorities have got an absolutely key role to play in terms of, in terms of regeneration, in terms of business engagement. And just thinking, of, thinking through something said earlier about actually some business leaders need to start thinking differently about how they um, develop their workforce and then how as public services we can respond to their needs around Training and development, and using our skills, our skills budgets in a in a way that uh, in a way that can help them to, to grow. Now that's something that needs some coordination around it, and there are significant kind of hard and soft levers that we have at our, at our disposal to help shape the way that businesses, the decisions that some businesses make, and also to provide that kind of conduit between between like kind of local residents and and growth. And for me, that that's something where. We've got a key, a key role to, to fill and to shape national policy as well in terms of where things, where things aren't working. So I don't think it's a case of it's either only down to local residents to do everything on their own, or it's only up to local authority to, in effect, take the mantle and work on behalf of everybody. It's actually how we bring those two things together yeah. into a concerted joint, joint action to where we get the best, the best dividend. And that's where I, I, I genuinely think something like the ageing of working Greater Manchester is starting to kind of, I think it's starting to push both how we, how we work more collaboratively, both across, across agencies, but also with our, with our residents. I'm thinking this from a kind of personal kind of economic development perspective, I suppose, uh, whilst also using the levers we have at our disposal to, to genuinely shape national policy in a way that hasn't been done before, whilst also significant important messages into businesses about their, their behavior and how they and how they work so for me if you can get that kind of blend working working effectively then everybody's a winner brilliant thanks paul yeah I, I, um there's a kind of almost an ideological point of view in all this i think um if you think about 2000 again uh 2010 11 12 13 i think there was a and the kind of big society narrative that came through from government at the time. Uh, I think that was also kind of replicated in elements of uh, the kind of local voluntary sector organisations, or, or some of them where there was this idea that the local state needs to get out of the way, we can do things ourselves and so on. And I think that was a very um, uh, powerful um, demi-movement in a way, if that's the right term. I think that approach is fundamentally wrong though because I think uh, and I think the evidence uh, plays this out that um, in those areas particularly with low income areas unless you've got that spine of the local state convening as has been described already of, uh, of and that can be elected members it can be officers um, uh, bringing together different partners being able to draw down resources uh, from uh, local air, lo the local council or the NHS or otherwise. Unless you've got that, s that spine or skeleton of the local state active in low-income low income areas, um, then uh, those low-income areas are going to do even worse, I think. Now, uh, there's an, an example of that, I guess, is in our Edging in Place program. So this is work where we're trying to implement the kind of GM uh, reform principles around 
ageing populations. It's in 12, 12 areas in Greater Manchester, and they range from, if you like, inner city urban core, um, uh, semi-rural areas and all points in between. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see how this plays out in different ways. What's central in all those areas is the ability of local elected members, of local officers, of elements of the local state to be able to bring together act key actors, including all the residents, to make local plans and to act on those plans in a way that improves the quality of life of all the people. Take that element out of the, out of the picture and I think um, at best you can stand still. So um, I'm not sure that answers John's so it's, a, it's a blend and it's a, a blend, isn't it? I think everyone's saying it's a blend, and but, I think but local government is a key point. You need both, yeah. is what you're saying. It's not up to the individual. Yeah. Not what about Richard? You wanted to answer this as well. Uh, yes, right. I, I really like the word village, and you may be surprised to know that I live in a village as well. It just happens to be a village inside the city of Liverpool, and in fact, most of us live in villages, a territory an area which we understand, where we go to the same bus stops, we probably use the same doctors, the same schools, the same churches, the same chemists, and there is that element in which we all live in villages, and that's important to remember, because if you think of Pam's uh, discussion before about creating a new village, essentially, where rich and poor and young and old and black and white can all live together, that's a village. Whereas what we've created in too many of our cities, including my own, are ghettos. Sometimes ghettos of the rich, sometimes ghettos of the poor. But we, as councillors, or our forefathers did in the 50s and 60s, broke our cities up and destroyed that concept of village. So a key part of my work, whether it's looking after the needs of our third age or our youngsters, is to recreate the villages of Liverpool. Thank you. I think um, I might also just answer this question as well and put in a plea. I've, I've got my own microphone. Um, there's also age-friendly cities and communities. I know this question came from a rural community, and um, in many rural communities, we're not talking about places that have bus stops or where there is um, local government very easily accessible. And I think individuals can take a role in leading and asking their local district, parish district and county councils to take on, maybe join the Age Friendly Communities Network, use that framework, and they may be far away. But actually, there's a role that each institution in even the smallest places can play. But um, John, I think you need to get your, all of your councils to start thinking about that as an approach. So that's one answer. I think we have a question online, actually, so, um, and one in the audience as well. So I'll take the one online first and then come back to you, if that's OK. If I can get. So this has come from uh, Carol Donnelly, and she says, uh, in my home city of Coventry, we even, we, even as a Marmot city, have focused on the young youth and working under 50s with the rest of us left out. So she says, how do we, as, a local, as local citizens, re really get the message out to local authority leaders who have less resources and competing priorities? Great, good question. I'm thinking that might be a good question for you, Matt, because one of the things I've talked to you about, and it's something my experience as the head of localities going from local authority to local authority, is they're often, when people have competing questions, it's often the economic argument that can, people are asking me for. And Matt, I was just interested in what might be that catalyst. Um, it is a really interesting question. Even yes, yesterday at the, at the Marmot um, launch, to be honest, a significant focus was, still, was on was on early years, um, and understandably, understandably so. And I suppose, for me, there are two things, which, which is kind of what I said at the, at the, at the lectern. So it's kind of a, a, a moral reason for doing, for doing something differently, um, and the statistics behind that, and the stories behind failure in this area are pretty horrific. But where we started to see real traction um, on the uh, economic front and on kind of skills and employment has been as much about the reality is our economy will not grow as quickly as we would like it to unless we do something significant in this in this space and I think that's a relatively new realization um, that you know, can no longer rely on um, uh, young people coming through the education system and filling and filling the in the kind of the, the gap 
But I think that's a really difficult message, and, a, and a, it's a message we need to get out consistently and consistently well across a whole range of across a whole range of agencies. Because even most business leaders, if I go to the Chamber of Commerce and go to some of their, their, their events, when, when the business around the table, they think about and they talk about how they can how they'd like to change the education system, how they'd like to do more around work experience placements for younger people, how they would like to, to shape the curriculum more, and less about, actually, what do I need to do as a business leader to ensure I've got a healthy and productive workforce to ensure that I'm investing in the development of my, of my staff? Um, and I do think, whether this is a good thing or a, or a, bad, or a bad thing, the potential implications of, of Brexit will force that agenda to some extent because um, we will no business will no longer be able to re rely on a migrant workforce to come in and fill some of those some of those gaps. So I think getting some of the kind of hard numbers behind that argument is absolutely imperative, and I would do that at a local level. And the other thing is we've seen some real traction by getting some really good business leaders talking about this and some of that business-to-business -business support, uh, whether that's the co-op locally who are fantastic in this, in this space uh, or others. I think there's, there's, there's something about we, we definitely need to change that, change that narrative. Fantastic. Thank you. Richard? A, a, a politician's response to that is that probably people over the age of 50 are the most influential members of the community. Uh, why? Because as far as I'm concerned, you go and vote in far greater numbers than anyone else. Not only do you vote, you look after most of the school governing places in my ward. You run the charity shops. You run the amenity groups. You run almost everything. And in your spare time, you look after your grandchildren. And sometimes you're looking after your parents as well. So... I probably find that 75 to 80% of my regular interactions are with people who are 50 plus, but they very rarely raise their own problems. And perhaps you ought to be more focused on your needs because people come to talk to me about their kids' needs, their streets' needs, whatever it is. They don't talk about theirs. So use that influence and that time that some of you have to make sure that people like me are listening to your problems, not just other people's. Great. Yeah. I think I would echo what Richard said about using um, local members um, as a conduit to having a bigger voice in uh, local decision making and what matters to you, because what matters to uh, my councillors and my members matters to me. Um, as a chief executive and to my um, my team. So I would definitely advocate that. And just picking up the data issue, um, local authorities are getting a lot smarter about how they use data. Um, so it could be that they come and find you because they're looking at their heat maps of where older people are and where younger people are. Um, and we are getting much more sophisticated, especially with our public health colleagues, about forensically analysing um, how our population is distributed um, across local authorities. Great, thanks, Pam. Paul? It, it's an, I mean, this is a really good example yeah. of this kind of paradox. So we, everybody knows, and uh, Natalie set out right at the start, the kind of the, the numbers, the ways that um, uh, are communities and cities are urging. But at the same time, there seems to be some kind of resistance sometimes for local authorities or other agencies to try and to, to grip, get some grip and leadership on this agenda. And it's, it's one of the things that, you know, we kind of think about all the time, I think, in our work. Um, and I think one of the lessons is unless you keep up the, unless you keep up the kind of communication strategy, unless you form and, and convene groups of uh, local people, develop these emblematic programs and projects, and very quickly the local system just settles down to business as usual. So the, there's a kind of almost agitational aspect to the work that we do. Uh, and, so, you know, Matt mentions the impact around the economy. I think some of the initial work that was done um, pointed out that if GM had the same employment rate amongst people between 50 and state pension age, uh, as uh, the national average, it would be worth something like £850 million pounds 
the year to the GM economy. And at that point where some of your colleagues have been kind of um, un un under the table on their, uh, I wouldn't say Blackberries, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, the, whatever we do now, um, they kind of lean into the discussion. Well, that's actually that's pretty important, quite interesting. So there is something about combining the ageing agenda with other corporate and city priorities. I think there's just one other thing as well about all this is um, is uh, you know um, you know organize yourselves into a you know, I remember a northern city over the Pennines people were asking me you know we can't get any traction on this I said well, just call a meeting call it age friendly whatever and see who turns up some pressure into the system and actually a large part of our work inside the local authority has been on that basis if we wait for everybody to sign up and to get the concepts and to commit resources, we, you, you get nowhere, I think, on some of this agenda. You have to be bold and take chances. And Yeah, brilliant. Agitate. Thanks very much for those answers. We have a question from our audience here. Sorry. Hello. Um, my name is Maggie Joan Haggis, Third Age Hostels. Um, my question or comment is partly about the outdoor um, little equipment in the, in the local parks and stuff like that. Um, Manchester is now the second most popular tourist destination in Britain. Liverpool's trying to catch up, of course. <laughs> but um, <laughs> any other tourist destinations, particularly coastal ones, they will already have had equipment in their small parks because they've got a lot of older people coming in who are tourists and also people living there. So why we haven't put more focus on that before now, not just on raising money within uh, wealthier areas? I'd uh, be interested to have some comments about. Thank you. Uh, well, we, the answer is in most of our parks, we already have some of these facilities. They're not very well used because partly because people don't have confidence in using them uh, and partly because uh, they're in the wrong place, they're the wrong stuff. So what we're trying to do is not to reinvent the wheel, but to have a look at what things are being used for and put them in the right location in some cases. The best one's in Wigan. We're going to go and see it, actually. Okay. Well, that, that's the answer. Go and have a look. Uh, there's nothing new. Learn and do it better. I think the, the weather is a problem. For <laughs> <laughs> Not in Liverpool. <laughs> um, we, okay. We, there is some truth. So actually, Jane, who's sat behind you, might be able to uh, add, add some more detail. I know um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, we, uh, up in Blakely, I think it was, there was um, equipment. It got national press, and uh, there was a lot of interest. But I think the evaluation of it showed that it wasn't well used for various reasons. Uh, I, I might be wrong, but I know I've got some colleagues in the audience who have more knowledge of this. But... Um, uh, so we need to think about that, uh, and I think we need to think in a round about physical activity and and making this a normal part of getting older and of our lives. But um, the weather is an issue uh, for use of these equipment. You know, I'm, when we go to Spain or wherever it is, and you're wandering down the uh, promenade, and suddenly there's uh, you know a group of older residents enjoying themselves, and you think, yeah, I could do that. But um, in Longford Park on a Tuesday afternoon, it's not a great uh, prospect. No, thanks. Oh, yeah, long, yeah. oh, OK. <laughs> thanks for that question. I've got one at the question at the back, Dave. I think it is. Thank you. Um, we've talked about the tensions, perhaps, between services and ageing well, and some of the, the prioritisation where younger people are focused on or businesses aren't thinking about the generation of workers they've got and how do they value and sustain that. So what do the panel think is the role of ageism in that? Uh, what, in terms of that negative narrative about ageing, how much have people been dismissed and how much is ageism, do you think, part of the thinking or the lack of thinking around stuff we've been talking about? And if that's the case, what do we need to do about that? That's a great question. Um, Pam, you're holding the microphone ready. I think, I think there is ageism. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, and I think um, it's up to us to challenge that um, and create a different narrative and talk about the opportunities of ageing, what that means. Matt's talked about the economy 
um, and what we're missing out on. And I think for me, it's about changing the narrative. It's also about changing some of the images. Um, I can remember one of my first meetings um, when I took over the portfolio for ageing. I was seeing uh, people, um, images um, with sticks and hunched over. And, uh, and I'm not saying that as you get older, you might not need um, help. Um, but that cannot be the overriding image of ageing. Ageing comes in all different forms, in all different ways. And I think, as certainly as a local authority, we've got a, an obligation and a duty to promote positive images. Promote positive images anyway, because there's a lot of negative bias um, in the media, for example, um, which we have to counter. So I think it's about making sure that communication is... Um, positive but realistic um, not not to get oh aging's all great you know when my dodgy knees are hurting me a bit it's because I'm getting older you know um, but it's how we're dealing with that and how we are um, uh, kind of promoting those images and also I think it's about promoting intergenerational images so again it's not separating things out it's looking at aging across the board you know as Richard said he's been aging for a long time Sorry, Richard. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's about, so it's about not, not, not saying, oh, well, when you're 50, you're aging. Or, you know, and it's kind of like, no, it, it should be, these images should be uh, positive, well thought through, and not the sh there isn't a cutoff in terms of uh, what age you are. I think we need to change the narrative. Uh, and one of the problems I have as a counsellor is I do spend, as I said earlier, more, spend more of my time talking about the problems caused by ageing than the opportunities caused by ageing. The financial crisis for adult social care dominates us, so therefore the narrative is that old people are a problem. Well, I am a problem to some people. The whole of the Labour Party in Liverpool, <laughs> chief officers of the council, and any minister that happens to come within my ambit at any one time. But I've given you the examples of the contributions that older people make to my community. They run almost everything. Uh, I just go out regularly, uh, not, don't quite, quite so much now as my grandchildren have got older, and I'd be chatting to people, on grandma, grandpa duty, are you this afternoon? Oh, yes, something that we do regularly. And yet we're told that apparently we're wasting time, we're just taking benefits. Society would collapse without the inputs put in by older people formally and informally into our community. Let's celebrate that and work out how we can help them, or us in my case, do it better. Great. Cool. I mean, this is one that we've, um, uh, uh, this is one that we've, we've thought about, talked about, read about, and acted on for a long time. And it's a, it's a really, I mean, it's a societal, issue isn't it you know you think about the recent general election i don't think aging older people were mentioned at all uh, in, in in that um in that election other than possibly by proxy in terms of health and care i think uh, and i think many of the points have been made there is one point i, I do want to make about you know i, I said that there are these kind of different gazes on aging and um, i think in large part in public policy uh um, the gaze of the health service dominates. And the language of the health service, broadly speaking, around ageing is not a helpful one, I don't think. Whether that's bed blockers or frailty or um, uh, various acronyms that are used, uh, have been used in the NHS around older people and so on. And I think that, uh, I think that, that perspective and that gaze um, has made it more difficult um, to develop a narrative which is um, which is more realistic and, and more positive, you know. I, I, if I just very briefly, mm. I, I, I did a presentation a couple of years ago to um, uh, a group, I think it was a national program on frailty. I think they brought me in for, um, to, to spice things up maybe, or maybe not, I don't know. But they brought me in to basically <laughs> say something different to everybody else. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's the words were leading my mouth, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> that there you go. And um, yeah, so uh, you know, I, I so I told this story, and I think uh, I, I think it was something that, that Dave was involved in, uh, or even organised at one point. And this was a film club in uh, up in um, northeast Manchester, 
um, uh, uh, people said, well, we want a film club, etc. So uh, a, local, a license was bought to show local films. Uh, it's, it's called Front Row thing. It's still going now, 15 years later. And it's actually led to the, basically the running of a local community centre in many ways. And so I tell this story, and somebody puts a hand up. Said, well, what a great example of a preventative project. And I kind of sat there thinking, OK, well, I can see what you mean, but actually going to the cinema, meeting with friends, enjoying yourself, if we do that when we're in our 30s and 40s and 50s, do we call that prevention? Or do we just say that's just having a good life? Yeah. And I think that's part of the game. Is this preventing bad things happening? Is this stopping you doing it? Are you, can we push you away? Now, I understand if you're in those locations, in those services at the moment, that it's very difficult not to hold on to that perspective. But unless we shift that language, um, we're going to demonise old age. And I, lastly, I think... Uh, uh, on Twitter now or on social media, you know, this kind of language that you're getting from parts of the kind of quasi-political uh, scene around boomers and you've stolen all the money and all the rest of it is really, really unhelpful, you know? Mm. Thanks, Paul. Matt, I'm sure you yeah, just, see... Just a couple of things, just on, on language, actually. So I'm, I'm absolutely certain that there's ageism in the, in the workplace. Um, how much of that is conscious or unconscious bias, I'm not 100% certain. I think some of it is down to lazy practice, if I'm honest, um, in, terms of, in terms of recruitment. So, you know, I, I reflect on some of the kind of job adverts I may have had in the past, you know, wanted to, do you want to work in a dynamic, fast-paced environment? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, I want to come to work, be conscientious, do a good job at the right, the right quality. Um, and it's some of those things we're actually working with employers now. Think about, you know, what did you actually, what are you actually looking for, or what does your business need? Does the language you're using in your advert, does the types of pictures you put up about your your kind of ideal worker, does that match what you actually need? And it's just there's a significant role for kind of both being more intelligent with our with our language, more thoughtful with our with our language. And we are actually using some good practice that Aging Better uh, developed around, a good, around an, an employment guide. That we, we're trying to run through the GM Good Employment Charter to try and help businesses think differently about is that flexible recruitment, uh, about the language that they use, about how they, how they upskill their staff. And it, and it works both, both ways because we also find that fewer older people ask for training and support. So there's something about, actually, this is... You've got every right to ask for this, to ask for training as somebody who's, who's new into the organisation. You know, if you're a 50-year-old, you could have another 20 years or more in the workplace. You know, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of time. Um, so, that, so there's a significant amount of work to, work to do. And I think, I still think there's a real fear as well around, around ageism and, the, and what is the right language to, to use. So the, the final point is, I think you just kind of touched upon it, how we, we, we reconcile some of those additional responsibilities that often come in old age around caring uh, with the workplace and what can we do with businesses to start looking at you know, job carving, changing, changing the way jobs are configured so that they actually make sense in the way that we do when people go on, on maternity leave or, you know, or, 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 or for young people. But we don't, we don't seem to do that for some reason uh, when people have got caring responsibilities when they're, when they're older. Mm -hmm. but there's quite a lot of education, I think, but some, probably some real practical things that we can do to make it make a difference. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Good answers. I think we've got about five more minutes. I think we've got time for one more, one more question over here. So, Tracy, I think you've got a question. I can see your name badge. Hi. So, Tracy and I work in the um, GN Aging Hub. Um, within the last 10 years, I think I heard that uh, somebody who is 16 now will look forward to living, or everybody who's 16 now, will look forward to living to 100. But I read uh, recently that four people that lived in the same space celebrated being over 100. It was a birthday celebration. But these seven people that live in this one place were over 100. So, and this is in uh, a residential care home setting in Ferry, Presswich, the Fed. 
So that everybody who's 16, it's like we had time to prepare for this. It's happening now. We've got a lot of older people living a lot longer now. And my question is about the social care sector. And do we feel ready for the situation that we're in to be able to kind of address and meet the needs of those people that are living much longer, later lives? And certainly for those that are being cared for in the home setting as well. Are we meeting everybody's needs truly? Thanks, Tracy. Actually, I'm going to see if I can just take one more question over there and those two and maybe have a quick response from the two questions. Have we had a question over there? Yep. Before I sum up. My name is uh, Yolande. I'm a disruptor in uh, ridding the, um, the workplace of age bias. Um, my question for the panel um, uh, is regarding... Um, start education early with uh, young people um, so that they don't see older people as being a problem. Uh, what are the panel members' views on getting that right at grassroots in education with very young people? Fantastic. Thank you. Actually, that sort of sounds like, in a way, we've got the, what are we doing with the, and I wish I hadn't started this, centigenarians, that pronounce that. Um, are we ready for them? And also, are we ready for the next, for younger people and how they're thinking ahead to old age as well? That's sort of either end. We haven't got time quite to go into the whole of the social care system today, but anyone want to give a quick question about how we think about both ends there? Uh, well, there is no real national thinking about ageing. Uh, we were due to get a green paper, never mind a white paper or a bill, in June 2017. We now don't know when it's coming, but the idea is we'll try and get an all-party agreement on it. And I think that's actually important uh, because we're talking about things 30, 40 years on, and the more consensus we get now, the more likely it is to last a change uh, in government. So I think we need to address these big issues, and we should have been doing it 30 years ago because it's 30 years since we started realising there would be this explosion. Mm. And yet we are woefully unprepared for it now as society. We don't know how we're going to pay for it. We haven't trained a workforce to deal with it. We haven't got the right housing. We haven't got the right dom domiciliary care uh, uh, support. And we've known about this problem 30 years, never mind what's going to be happening in 60. The real problem is that you elect people like me for four years. And the fact is that I've successfully passed that barrier a number of times. When you try and get a national politician to think any longer than the next general election, it's a real, real difficulty. That's why we've got to get together to all parties. And that's why it's important for people like you to challenge people like me in every party. Bloody well forget your party. Bloody well work together to try and solve this problem. Great. Paul, were you going to say something maybe about the... Yeah. What do they do with young people? Yeah, well, just, young. On, just on the social care thing first, I think the, the real danger about what's happening is that we're, uh, and think about Mormons and so on, like inequalities, what's happening is we're do, you know, developing a two-tier social care service. So those who rely on the state uh, and those who can find uh, funding to support them, themselves or their families in later life. And I think that's one of the... Uh, one of the dangers that, that, that we have. Um, in terms of the, the kind of young people, there are 101 brilliant projects out there, I think, around involving young people with older people and everybody in between. There are great resources for working in schools. There are great programs. One of my favourite is, uh, favourites is an, an American one called Experience Corps, mm. where uh, older, retired people are working in schools, uh, uh, with um, uh, to get people's uh, 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 educational standards up and enjoy life themselves. So there's there's lots of stuff out there. I think there is. It's a tricky one because you, you there's always a worry that the, the issue around generational relationships is it a moral panic which happens every five or ten years or is it something real that we have to do things about? It's probably a little bit of both. So um, th this, there's lots of good stuff out there. You just need to have a look around. I think. Okay, thank you. I'm at risk of running over, which I'll try not to do. But um, thank you very much. I'm sure everyone 
will join me in thanking our speakers. Just to sort of, I've got to sum up, gosh, um, a really wide ranging conversation, but I think there is something there really about convening and the role of all different stakeholders, local government acting as a convener, talking to people locally, challenging ages, and so they actually um, want to be able to demand more themselves and think they're worth demanding something, as well as us within the system, demanding more of our politicians and our officers to create changes we know can make a difference. The life course approach has come up, and I think you know we could have a whole other discussion. We probably have had another event about how we think about all of um, that. Before we finish, I'm also going to make a little bit of a plug, really, as well, because I think something's really important, both Liverpool, hopefully Liverpool City region, I've heard murmurings, certainly Greater Manchester and Stockport are all members of the World Health Organization's global network of cit cities and communities. At Centre for Aging Better, we support the UK network, of which there are 38 local authorities signed up. Um, and that covers nearly 21 million people, and that comes from town councils, county councils, district councils, and um, nearly all the core cities. Now, that's a way, that's a kind of off-the-peg framework people can use to actually start to have some of these conversations convene and start to thinking about those emblematic projects and the kind of leadership every single person can take um, and every single stakeholder can take in their local place. So... Hopefully that's been a stimulating conversation. It has been for me and really interesting, and I really do want to thank our panellists today. I've had a great time. Do feel free online to um, add any of your thoughts. Thank you.